The Listening to Indigenous Voices Dialogue Guide on Justice and Right Relationships, produced by the Jesuit Forum for Social Faith and Justice. It showcases Indigenous voices and the many elements of their traditional knowledge and skills inherited from their ancestors. It's an indispensable tool for all those who want to make a difference today in building bridges across ignorance and racism. Let's listen to Mike Shaw, parish administrator at St. Edward the Confessor Mission, to see how the faithful at the mission have engaged with the dialogue guide and what they have learned. It's more than just one. There are three groups. One is a group of 12, reaching right across Canada. Uh, two of the groups are from the local parish, and they're about five people each. What have we learned? I think we've learned how ignorant we are. The booklet covers language. It covers misuse of land. It covers how land and and animals and the nature is seen by the indigenous people. So I think the main thing that I would say we have learned is just how ignorant we are of the background, the history and the culture of the indigenous person. I think the experience of learning that, for example, Across Canada, 0.59% of a person has TB, whereas 151 people in the indigenous community have TB. I think looking at the prison system, that the indigenous person represents 5% of the total population in Canada, and yet the prison population both male and female, constitutes 34%. And women, in a women's prison, the indigenous population represents 44%. I think looking at the fact that 6% of Canadian homes are in need of repair, whereas 44% of homes on indigenous property and Inuit property require repair. I think reading, reading the fact that in London, Ontario, there is a river called the Thames that goes down to Oneida, which is a community of indigenous people. And in 2018, 225 million liters of untreated sewage was allowed to go down that river into the aquifer of that community. In 2019, in one month alone, it was 5.5 million liters. It made me realize that I have inherited clean water, a safe home, easy access to the medical world, and the chances of me being in prison are highly, a lot smaller than if I was an indigenous person. There has to be a sense of humility, and also a desire for the truth. And as Jesus says, the truth will set us free. Why do I say humility? Because what you hear and read in the for book, um, the forum that was created by the Jesuit people, or Jesuit order, is that our understanding of our position relative to the indigenous people is totally inaccurate. It's totally inaccurate. So why would I recommend it to parishes? I think if the people come, whoever they might be, with a humble heart and a desire for truth, it can cause a radical change in how they see themselves. It can cause a radical change in how they see their relationship with the indigenous person. But also on top of all of that, there are stories, for example, of creation that really are incredibly beautiful and match or even are better than our own creation story from Genesis. So I would say humility and truth will be the elements that would have the people participating go through some sort of transformation. I think as a pastor, it's made me realize that I have to really listen to my community. I have to start listening. Interestingly enough, I had some friends come over for a meal the other night 
uh, who know me very well, they've known me for 47 years, and one of the comments they made was, are you okay because you're not talking too much? I said, no, I think that's because of what I've been through with this process. So I would say the process of listening, of slowing down, and of learning from other people is paramount to the experience that I had, and I hope other people will have. I don't think the discernment group will finish. I think it's an ongoing process because there's so much to learn. Secondly, there are two elements that have impacted us already, one more clearly than the other. The first one was that when we heard about the res residential schools and the children that were buried there, we decided back in July, August of last year, that we'd have two minutes of silence before we celebrated Eucharist in memory of the children. A fourth group, which I have not mentioned, which is headed up by Rosalie Shushak, uh, looks primarily at the residential school tragedy. And what we tried there was to say, what can we do? And what came back was, it's not a question of how much you can do, it's how much you can learn. And it is up to the indigenous people to tell you what they want you to do, not what you think you can do. However, we do have effect with the Canadian government, and we have been trying to put together a letter, and this is over three or four sessions now, to put a letter together commenting on the plight of the indigenous person in such a way that it will have impact at the government level. So that's one thing we would propose to do. The Listening to Indigenous Voices Guide is a self-contained kit to engage with others on themes related to justice, reconciliation, right relationships, and decolonization with Indigenous peoples. Starting a group is easy. Groups of five to eight are an ideal size for the sharing circle process. If you're in a parish or school, ask your pastor or principal for their support or blessing. Groups could be formed in families, schools, organizations, communities, workplaces, or wherever people gather. If you can, make your group as diverse as possible, including newcomers, settlers, and indigenous persons. The guide is available in both French and English. The Sharing Circle the guide process uses a sharing circle to engage in dialogue and reflection. All you need to know for the process is explained in the dialogue guide. Here are a few tips. You can contact the Social Action Office of the Archdiocese of Montreal to get some Quebec-specific inserts for the Dialogue Guide. 